I'm Fran Strawn and today I'm on the couch with Simon Hunt. Simon, you're a lecturer at the College of Fine Arts and Digital Media. You specialise in sound and music, but a lot of people are more familiar with you as the character Pauline Pants Down. Can you tell us a little bit about how that character came about? Yeah, no, sure. Um, Pauline, well, Pauline Pants Down was a parody of Pauline Hanson. Pauline Hanson was a politician who rose to prominence in the late 90s in Australia, who was best known, I guess, for her, her views about uh, a so-called privilege of Aboriginal people and Asian migrants, um, what I, I really perceived it to be a racist agenda. So uh, I decided that the best way to take her on in that way was really to, to do a parody. And in that, I, um, I took various speeches of hers and I uh, cut them up in a digital sampler and made these two pop songs. And uh, one of those songs, I'm a Backdoor Man for the Ku Klux Klan, was, um, was banned um, or banned temporarily and, and that went into a high court case. The other one, I Don't Like It, uh, became a, a top ten hit and I became a sort of a, a popular character for about six months or so and I, I actually ran for the uh, the New South Wales Senate in the 1998 federal election um, at the same time as, as working against her. So it was like a, a sort of a serious political thing within this sort of comic guys, I guess. My shopping trolley murdered. My groceries just gone. I don't like it. No, 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 I don't. Never did. I don't like it. I don't like anything, anything, anything. I don't like it. No, 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 I don't. No, I went near. I don't like it. I don't like anything, anything, anything. Please explain. Why can't my blood be coloured white? I should talk to some medical doctors. And it worked well, obviously. It was a huge success and people have described it as, well, the character of Pauline as a brilliant example of electoral guerrilla theatre. Was that how you'd set out? Pretty much. I mean, that electoral guerrilla theatre, that was a, um, Professor Larry Bogart in the United States. He wrote a book um, partially about what I did um, in which he talked about it that way and, and, and people who use... Um, electoral tactics to use parody within electoral tactics because I guess one of the things I was doing was trying to emulate her whole methodology and the way that that she would appear in the media as well because she tried to present herself as I'm just a natural person I'm not a typical politician but the more I examined her the more I realized how constructed she really was so I guess my aim was to in in exposing that construction by sort of parodying it and copying everything that she did appearing in the same media and all that, that I could sort of subtract that populist front of her from the campaign and then just, just really to try and in some ways point at what I saw were her rather ugly policies. So that was sort of complex but in the construction of it. But I guess people have taken that in different ways. A lot of people just remember me as a drag queen singing a trashy song, you know, that was a top ten hit on the radio and ha-ha, that was funny. But um, that's fine too. You know, I think different people had different responses to that. But it was a, it was a really satisfying project in that it was po political, which, you know, a lot of work I've done is political. Um, it was also enormous amounts of fun. I just felt like the biggest... 12 year old in the world I guess. And and you managed to merge politics with popular culture. I mean one of the satirical songs that you wrote was nominated for an aria. Um, was that the beginning of your experimentations with music or did that start before that? Oh no music, music and I go a long way back you know I played in heavy metal bands when I was 12 years old and then sort of punk and, you know, experimental stuff. Um, I was with a band in Berlin in the mid-1980s working with sort of classical structures and audiovisual stuff and then I I formed a duo with some members of, with a, oh, a guy from the Berlin Philharmonic doing some classical, contemporary classical music um, throughout Europe in the 80s and then um, I was doing some film music and film sound and then I left music for a while and got into filmmaking and had some successful short films. This is like the, the 90s, I guess. And then Pauline was sort of like my return to music in an utterly different way, I guess. That sort of Pauline somehow brought me back, which is a surprising thing to think of, that she could have done that to me. But she did. She did, <laughs> yeah. And in terms of political performance, hmm. um, if you could relate all of those ideas that you had for Pauline to a, a politician today, who, who would you choose to, to parody? There's, there's no one who ticks all the boxes, you know, like, uh, like 
there's videos on YouTube of, you know, my single, I don't like it and stuff, and people are saying, yeah, he should do Kevin Rudd or he should do blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, it's just way too boring, you know. I mean, a lot of people think I should still be satirising Pauline Hanson now, but to me, she's sort of stolen my thunder. She's become the B-grade drag, drag queen sort of appearing on TV shows Dancing Badly, which is really the, the career trajectory that people would have expected from me, I guess, rather than becoming a university lecturer, but she's um, sort of taken that on, taken on that role. So there's no point in parodying that anymore. I mean, the only person I've really seen in the last couple of years who would be worth parodying was um, Sarah Palin, who was a, a, you know, the potential vice presidential candidate in the last American election, because she, <clears throat> she had these ab abhorrent views, she was uh, unusual, she had a recognisable voice and she um, was, in my perception, sort of stupid enough to say silly things that I found quite funny, you know, such as that the dinosaurs never existed. But um, um, I didn't, I, I looked at her for a couple of weeks and thought, no, she'll be gone, she'll be gone in a month or so, but if she was to run again, I'd, I'd definitely have a, look at that, have a look at those possibilities. But it's funny because I think that uh, satire with using media and using media cut up to, to satirise things is much more prevalent than it was 10 years ago. You have every sort of 14, 15 year old in the world sort of cutting up movies to sort of give them different meeting, uh, meanings and uploading them on YouTube and it's sort of people are a lot more I think media aware now and so to, to get something that sort of cuts into people's awareness uh, is a much bigger job these days perhaps than it was back then. Mm, because everyone's putting their view across and media is accessible now and yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. can sit at what home. What people and... refer to as Web 2, which is sometimes a cliche, sometimes exaggerated in, in its definitions, but there definitely is a sort of a trend towards uh, people sort of seeing themselves as being part of the, the media interface, even you know, in the way that we socially organise ourselves or even the art world, you know, even the, the fine arts world. I mean, I'm from the College of Fine Arts and the fine arts world runs itself through Facebook with organisation of exhibitions and little pictures popping up and reminders and things like that. So we're very, it's very much a, a different media interface that we live in, you know. So I guess if you look back to something like Pauline 10 years ago, that was me trying to sort of like imitate her media interface. But I think everyone's doing that in some way now. Mm, yeah. And uh, getting back to your music, I know that you um, record and produce um, electro acoustic music and that you've got an interest in African, the significance of, of African music socially. Are they research interests for you or? Um, def definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, I've been making music, you know, my, all of my life now. So I tend to go through different stages and it's with my own practice at the moment, I tend to be going into an area that people don't really consider part of, say, fine arts, for example. I'm, I'm very interested in sort of jazz improvisation and things like that. I'm, because I've done the whole sort of uh, deep, dark experimental stuff in the 80s. Um, so not really interested in sort of regurgitating things again. I, the interest in African music, I guess, is um, that's a research interest. I'm interested in the perspective by which we look at sound and music in a global culture and that we tend to still within uh, European based education systems like Australia, uh, which you know, very much uses an English model in a lot of ways still, um, that it, we shouldn't really be looking at sound and music always from a, a Eurocentric uh, position. Just simply that if you look at the way people appreciate sound and music within different cultures of the world. The African sort of ideas of music and, and the place of music within African culture is reflected in a lot more countries and a lot more, a lot more of the surface of the planet than perhaps the, the European idea of classical music or its flip side of sound art. They're more of a little, a bit of a cul-de-sac in some ways or a one branch of the tree. And I tend to, so when I'm teaching, I tend to, this is all very complex and has you know, cut, it's really hard to sort of cut down into a, a little short bite. But um, I guess it's, when I say my interest in African music, it's not necessarily everyone should, should sit around and play drums, but it's more about we can examine a, a greater area of culture and, and types of cultures across the planet when we do it from an African centre than we can from a European one, for example. That's great. Thanks for your time today, Simon. Thanks very much.